Ladies and gentlemen, here we are again, live from the studio, Hudson County View, live at Uncut. I'm your host, your favorite cult of personality, your favorite person to tell you two and two makes three, John R. Heides, and it's been another eventful week here at Hudson County, as it always is. So first, we were going to uh, discuss a little bit about the latest ongoing legal woes of Sudan Thomas, the former Jersey City Board of Education president, as well as the former acting director of the Jersey City Employment and Training Program. An interesting development in his cases, he uh, appears to have some issues with legal representation. We'll tell you all about that. We're also going to discuss the latest with the Hoboken Rail Yard Redevelopment Plan. There was a heavily anticipated special meeting there in the Mile Square City last night. And as luck would have it, there didn't end up being a vote. We'll give you all the details on that one. We're also going to speak about some developments in the New Jersey State Assembly. Some of our Hudson County legislators have gotten some important leadership roles, so we're going to make sure that we go over that. And we also have an ongoing development with CarePoint Health and Alaris Health. That feud looks like it's coming to a head. It's really getting hot and heavy over there. So we're going to tell you the latest on that. And of course, we can't forget about our guest. Live from the studio, we're going to be interviewing next Jersey City Education Association President Rod Greco. So all that and maybe even a little more. But we're going to take our first break with our sponsor. We'll be right back. It takes more than a state-of-the-art medical facility to make a great hospital. It takes a team of dedicated medical professionals. That's the Jersey City Medical Center, Hudson County's number one hospital. Medical teams consisting of New Jersey's top doctors, magnet award-winning nurses, and accomplished hospital associates, all committed to your good health. That's what you have at the Jersey City Medical Center. Make Hudson County's number one hospital your first choice. Visit us on the web at at BarnabasHealth.org. Burns Brothers Memorials, Monuments, and Markers, 787 Tunley Avenue, Jersey City. Hudson County's only monument maker, serving all faiths and cemeteries. Design studio and launch inventory on site. Cemetery inscriptions and custom orders welcome. Burns Brothers Memorials, Monuments, and Markers, 787 Tunley Avenue, just south of Seacorkers Road. Craftsmanship that will last for all eternity. Burns Brothers, Jersey City, Albert H. Hopper, North Arlington. Visit us on the net. Hudson County View, live and uncut. John R. Heides, and as promised, we're joined by Jersey City Education Association President Rod Greco. Rod, great to have you. Hey, John, good afternoon. How are you? Very good, thank you. So, Rod, obviously uh, one of the hottest topics in Jersey City these days, needless to tell you, is this uh, potential referendum in November where it looks like the voters would decide if we stick with an elected board, if we go to an appointed board. I don't think uh, there's any question where you stand, but uh, for those that may have missed that council meeting at the beginning of the month, just tell us why you were so aggravated with what you were seeing and why your position is what it is. Well, I'll start with uh, the evening prior, which was Thursday, January 2nd, was the uh, reorganization meeting of the Jersey City Board of Education. And uh, Stephen Fulop, mayor, showed up to swear in the two candidates backed by the LaFrac ticket. Um, that was his first time I've ever seen him at a reorganization meeting, or his first, definitely was his first time swearing in board candidates. He sees me in the auditorium, gymnasium there. We speak often. Uh, he'll text me when he needs something. Uh, we didn't exchange any uh, you know, hellos or anything like that. Next morning, it's all over the media. So I, I did send the mayor a text message uh, to let him know of my dismay. And um, also the New Jersey Education Association, he reached out to them and I through text message uh, to say, this is to help you. Uh, we want to work with you. I want to fix the schools and, and the union can be a part of this. And our response was simply, you have no problem calling us or texting us whenever you need something, especially the state union, the New Jersey Education Association. There are a handful of mayors in the entire state that have that president's personal cell phone number and can get her at any time of the day. And she gives Steve Fulop that courtesy. So I think it was very disrespectful to uh, the president, uh, Marie Bliston of the NJEA, that he didn't even give a heads up. Uh, even even what's going on with Donald Trump, there's a, between the Republicans and the Democrats, there's a heads up, they know what's coming. 
so that was uh, a poor play on his part. So you felt like you guys were blindsided. We were blindsided. So to fast forward to the, to the council meeting, um, I did speak uh, for the five minutes uh, like a gentleman at first. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, was, I was sitting in the rear of the council chambers and a few people, you know, there was a lot of uh, yelling and excitement going on. And, uh, there sure like was. A, it's like a gymnasium in there, the echo, the echo chamber effect. So a few people were saying, turning around and looking at me saying, he's saying your name, he's saying your name. I said, oh. So I stood up and I heard Councilman Robinson again when he saw me, stated my name. So I said, what did you say? You know, what, what did you say? I, I couldn't hear him. Uh, and I never even heard what he said. It was something about Sudan Thomas, but I never heard what it was. I believe but he it, said that you supported Sudan Thomas for re-election. Oh, okay. Something we along did. those lines. We did support him. Uh, at that point, my, uh, my, my good old, the Italian Irish in, <laughs> in me got the better of me and I ran up there and uh, gave them a piece of my mind because I feel this is a power play. Uh, this is a grab by the mayor in the 11th hour and he'll, he'll deny it uh, if he were here and when you speak to him. He pleaded and begged the Board of Education, do not sever ties with the superintendent who just left. Um, I won't mention her name because of litigation purposes. That, that was the deal we struck. We would not speak her name, and I'm glad not to do that. But <laughs> he wanted her to stay here. I don't believe he wants to work with Franklin Walker. I don't believe he wants to work with Lorenzo Richardson because they're not the type of uh, people that he can control. And, uh, you know, this rhetoric of the board has to show accountability, the board has to become responsible, the board has to demonstrate uh, fiscal, uh, you know, restraint. Where was this, uh, where were these demands for the six and a quarter years that his gal pal was here, the superintendent and the state monitor, Catherine V. Coyle, who he brought in here. He brought in here in January 2012. And when she arrived on the scene, we questioned, we, the JCA, at that time I was the vice president, we had questioned him and said, what is she doing here? And it was only six months. That's what he swore. He promised six months. And we, uh, you know, reminded him that she was a former employee of this district who left under a cloud of, uh, you know, uh, suspicion and uh, wreaked havoc in her career here, was the henchman for the former superintendent who, who bragged that we went on strike, that she caused the strike and was proud of that. And, uh, but he swore six months. Well, here we are, 2020, and the person was just, uh, you know, alleviated of her duties from the New Jersey Department of Education in 2019. But uh, it was a long battle. So that's why, that's why I'm a little annoyed with the mayor. Uh, he talks about transparency. He has none. He blindsided the public with this. Forget about the union side of it. Forget about the teachers. Forget about the parents for a minute. What about the general public? But you should show respect to the parents. And many members of the general public are parents with children in the school system. So to do uh, a maneuver, a, a move like this, without any type of community forums, uh, maybe even six meetings in the wards, it's not a lot to ask of these council people to do. Uh, I mean, it would be nice to see their face out, out in the community once in a while. But to uh, make this move, I see it as a power play so he can control the Board of Education, control the contracts, control the flow of money, and um, his position of, if I have control of it, then I can fix the problems. I can help with the finances. Right. I think we both know the, the initial press release like the back of our hands at this point. Yeah. Right? Like they talked about five resignations over three years. They talked about the two indictments for Sudan Thomas. They spoke about the uh, quote-unquote anti-Semitic comment from Joe Terrell. Obviously, not everyone agrees with that, but that's a different story. Yeah. Uh, you know, and they said these are all reasons why we need to take control. So certainly you don't agree with that. I mean, why, why, but why? No, because, I mean, to throw in their five resignations, that's not, that's not fair at all. Uh, it, the first gentleman to resign, John Reichert, he moved to uh, Union County. So therefore, he had to, uh, you know, resign the seat. from the board, vacate the seat. Uh, the next person, unfortunately, was Angel Valentin, and he publicly announced why he was stepping down. He was in very poor health and struggling with uh, you know, some personal issues. So the time that is consumed with being on the board, he just couldn't do it anymore. And he was not in the best of health. He had been hospitalized. And uh, a good soldier, Angel, is a good person. He was on the telephone from his hospital bed for a few of those board meetings. So he resigned. Um, 
Mr. Shapiro and his family they relocated to California. He vacated the seat. Uh, Mr. Gies, Amy, who's, uh, you know, we all know her. She became the chair of the HCDO, and she's also a, a full-time, uh, you know, a school teacher by day. So, again, after a few months, she just did not have the time to, to uh, complete it. And then the fifth resignation was um, the reverend, Reverend uh, Lipe. Right, who, Fernandez. Fernandez, who had cited personal reasons. And, and we all had friendly dialogue back you know, at that time, and he had said, I, I'm thinking I'm probably going to uh, you know, make a move just for family and personal reasons. So five resignations over a few years, you can't cite that as a reason to seize control of a board of education. It's the municipality's responsibility to fund a school system. I mean, when you look around New Jersey, I don't know how many mayoral controlled boards or appointed boards there are. I know there's a few in the country. But th that's just not an excuse. It's, it's the way the United States public education is. The tax dollars fund the schools. So if there is a, a ballot question in November, we're going to have to wrap it up here, unfortunately, Rod. But uh, if there is a ballot question in November, there has been some talk, some suggestions that maybe the union would want to do a recall effort or two on the city council. Is that something you guys have discussed? The idea has been floated. A lot of members have brought it for, uh, forward, uh, you know, emailed me, texted me. A few people have called. Uh, we'll see where that goes. You know, I think these people forget that the, that the constituency, a large, we, we elect them. And a lot of people work for the school system, will be, or our parents who will be directly affected by this, or just citizens even who don't have children who will be affected by a mayoral uh, controlled school board. So, I mean, that's something we'll look at. Uh, our main goal is to educate people on this issue so they know when they're going in the voting booth uh, which choice to make, that they're well-educated and that they will make the choice that they feel is, is, is best. And we want to educate people as to both sides and, and let folks know that we voted on this in 2008 and overwhelmingly we moved back to an elected board. Very good. Rod, thanks so much for your time. Thank okay, you for thanks, tuning John. in. Okay, thanks, John. We're not done. We're just going to take a quick break, and I'll be back. Newport, the luxury waterfront community on the Hudson River, offers a quality of life you deserve in 10 high-rise rental towers with amenities such as the on-site Newport Path subway, light rail and ferry service, Newport Town Square, three playgrounds, dog run, upscale restaurants, retail giants like Sears, JCPenney, Macy's, and Target. Morton Williams Supermarket is just outside your front door. A health and fitness club, spa, skating rink, and medical facilities are also on site. NewportNJ.com. Enjoy the New York skyline from Newport Town Square. Manhattan is just one path stop away or a quick ride through the Holland Tunnel. Nursery and private elementary schools all on site. 12 screen movie theater at the Newport Center Mall. Want to visit Newport? Stay at the Western or Marriott Hotel. Go to NewportNJ.com for details. Newport has luxurious towers, great restaurants, shopping, New York skyline views, schools, playgrounds, a marina and yacht club, gym, spa, fine wine, fine living. It's incredible. It's you. NewportNJ.com. Newport. Live like you want. The Jersey City Medical Center. You know it for its award-winning, life-saving ambulance service. It's also your health hub. With health and wellness locations staffed with certified professionals all through Hudson County. The Jersey City Medical Center. Here to help you with your healthy. Here when you need us the most. The Jersey City Medical Center. Visit us on the net to learn more. Jersey City Medical Center, Robert Wood Johnson, Barnabas Health Facility. Let's be healthy together. Good Friend Self Storage in North Bergen, New Jersey is a fully climate controlled facility equipped with state of the art security, packing supplies, a refer friend program, and multiple loading docks convenient for commercial use. Located just off of Route 3 at 4301 Tunnelly Avenue, Route 1 and 9. Call 201 867 2444 or visit us on the web today. Good friend self storage. Let us be your good friend. Hudson County View live at Uncut, John R. Heidis, and now I'm with Mark Businich. So, Mark, great to see you again. Great nice to see you again, John. Thanks for holding down the fort last week. So, it was fun hosting, John. Very good. Glad to hear it. So, as usual, we're talking about Sudan Thomas. As everybody <laughs> knows, there is two different cases against him. We have 
one from the U.S. Attorney's Office, one from the New Jersey Attorney General's Office, mm -hmm. and there's also a civil case mm -hmm. that also revolves around JSEP, a former employee, a whistleblower suit, uh, which is the first person that talked about him writing these checks to cash. Mm -hmm. Now, the latest development that we have exclusively reported, and I don't believe anyone has followed up on yet this week, is that his attorney, Christopher Adams, is alleging that Sudan Thomas owes $25,000 for legal services, and since he hasn't been paid, he's looking to drop him as a client. So this is certainly not the kind of news you want if you're Sudan Thomas. These are two pretty prominent cases, and uh, you know the third one doesn't make life easy either. Uh, certainly quite a predicament, I guess, to put it nicely. Uh, you know, What's your take on this, Mark? A uh, very interesting development here, John, and great, uh, great job by you by getting the scoop. I mean, uh, yeah, according to the story that you wrote, um, he, uh, Sudan, that is, owes the firm uh, $25,000. I mean, I think at first he paid, according to what you wrote, at first he paid $10,000 to represent him. Uh, to re 15. For 50, right, 10000 for one case and then 5000 for the for the other. Yes. So it was a total of 15000 Yeah. Um, so, but now um, it seems that um, um, Sudan hasn't been paying forth or paying <coughs> the additional monies that he owes him. Uh, so the attorney in turn decided to drop him, as you, as you clearly stated. Yeah, so an interesting, another interesting aspect of this story, uh, Mark, and everyone watching. So the, it lays out a timeline of when he hired the law firm, and that uh, law mm -hmm. firm, just uh, escaping me for a moment, that's uh, Greenbaum, yes, Rose, right. Smith, and Davis LLP. Right. Uh, it's mostly referred to in the court filing as just GRSD. Uh, that's Chris Adams' firm. So anyway, my point was that they mm -hmm. give you a timeline. When they were hired on August 14th, mm -hmm. that was just five days after Nuria Sierra had filed suit asking uh, for the Attorney General and the U.S. Attorney to get involved for mm -hmm. his leadership at JSEP. And then on September 20th, uh, they agreed to represent him in a Division of Criminal Justice investigation. And those of you that have been following diligently, which mm -hmm. is probably pretty much all of you that are watching this, you would know that Sudan Thomas has been accused by, again, the EJ uh, Attorney General of accepting $35,000 in cash bribes in connection to a potential 2021 city council run. And those uh, charges came on December 19th. And of course, we know that uh, early in the new year, I believe that's January 3rd, mm -hmm. he was accused of embezzling $45,000 from JSEP uh, while serving as the acting director. So, you know, this is quite a predicament, even by Hudson County standards. Uh, you know, again, there needs to be an official ruling from the judge before uh, Chris Adams could just walk away. But, uh, you know, given the circumstances that he lays out here, it's mm. hard to imagine any scenario where they are parting ways here. You think that's a pretty fair assessment there, Mark? I, I think it sounds, it seems to be that way, John. And just, if, I, if I may, if I could just clarify as far as that $15,000 amount that I alluded to earlier. Sure. Uh, so Chris had accepted $10,000 for the DOJ case, Department of Justice case, right, in regards to the, uh, the, the suit filed by the U.S. District Attorney for New Jersey, correct? And then $5,000 for the civil case. And then, uh, as our viewers, uh, they can, of course, go to your article on the website and read that uh, Chris is, um, is uh, quoted here as saying that um, he has not, Thomas, that is, Sidon Thomas, has not paid the firm uh, for any of the work the firm completed to represent him further in the DC, J DOJ, or USAO investigations. Yeah, and I mean, the other thing is uh, at the end of that, he also says to date, you know, he owes more than $25,000 and that bill continues to grow each day. Mm -hmm. And he argues in the court filing, there's no risk of prejudice to Mr. Thomas to allow counsel to be relieved at this early state of litigation before any meaningful discovery has begun. So we'll see what happens. But, uh, you know, this is, again, a really uh, unfortunate turn of events uh, for Sudan Thomas. I mean, certainly this is things where you uh, want high profile c counsel. Certainly uh, not the type of thing I, I don't think anyone would want to approach with a public mm -hmm. defender. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, adding some further intrigue to this, Mark, I don't know if you're aware or if anyone else is aware really, but he was scheduled to have a central judicial processing uh, appearance over in Morris County Court, uh, Morris County Superior Court, I guess I should say, yesterday. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm not sure about the status. I mean, we, I was in contact with them throughout mm -hmm. the week. And as of Tuesday, he was scheduled to appear. Uh, I don't know what the status is, but we're certainly going to update you when we get some more information there. It would be really interesting mm -hmm. if he did not have counsel or if he used a public defender or if he had new counsel. So sure. certainly uh, all developments we're going to be keeping our eye on. So, And of course, you reached out to both parties, Thomas and Chris Adams, that is, and 
It's uh, unfortunate they couldn't get back to you, but of course that would have uh, enlightened our uh, readers and viewers a lot as well. Sure. So, you know, obviously we're going to uh, see what we see, but these cases look like they're a long way from done, but uh, an interesting development nonetheless, any way you slice it. Mm -hmm. So we're going to take another quick break. We're going to be right back. Consumer Carpets, 3408 Kennedy Boulevard in the Jersey City Heights, your one-stop store for residential and commercial floor treatments. Carpeting, linoleum, tiles, laminates, hardwood floors, area rugs, remnants, all major brands, all in stock. Free estimates, same-day installation. Consumer Carpets, it's savings, selection, installation. Credit cards and debit cards accepted. Financing available. Consumer Carpets, price to fit your budget, installation to fit your schedule. On the net at ConsumerCarpets.com. Consumer Carpets, Jersey City, 201-792-2712. Panapinto Properties, Jersey City. Shaping the workplace with state-of-the-art office space and an address your company desires. Building residences that define your home environment. Adjacent to all modes of transportation. On-site parking available. The right address, the right lease. 201-521-9000 or visit on the web at panapintoproperties.com. Panapinto Properties, building Jersey City for everyone. Rama Jewelers, located in the Lyndhurst Shopping Center at 413 Valley Brook Avenue, Lyndhurst. Come for all your jeweler needs at Rama Jewelers, where you will find a fine selection of necklaces, earrings, rings, and bracelets. Choose from one of our complete sets, our many signature items, or find the perfect engagement ring. Come on down, that's Rama Jewelers at 413 Valley Brook Ave, Lyndhurst. Call 201-939-5784 or visit us online today. Introducing the MyJCMC app, powered by Practice Unite. The free MyJCMC app puts the power of healthcare at your fingertips. Go to the concierge for access to referrals, scheduling, and appointments. See emergency room wait times and get directions to Jersey City Medical Center health locations. Read the latest JCMC news through their social media feed. Find a doctor and more. The MyJCMC app, we belong to you. Hudson County View, live and uncut, John R. Heides with Mark Businich. So uh, real quick notation, everyone. Uh, I said at the beginning of this broadcast that we'd be speaking about some changes at the assembly level that affects our Hudson County legislators. Angela McKnight of Jersey City and the 31st Legislative District is now the chair of the New Jersey Homeland Security and State Preparedness Committee. That's, of course, in the assembly. And also getting a leadership, uh, a top leadership role is Assemblyman Raj Mukherjee of the 33rd Leg Legislative District. He is now the Assembly Chair of the Judiciary Committee. And also two other Assembly women from Hudson, one being Angelica Jimenez of the 32nd District, and the, of course, Annette Chaparro of the 33rd Legislative District, also has received some upgrades on their respective committees. We see uh, Assemblywoman Jimenez will now be the Vice Chair of the Health Committee, while Assemblywoman Chaparro will now be the Vice Chair of the Law and Public Safety Committee. So, Hudson County News worth mentioning, but just a quick notation as we want to talk a little bit about last night's Hoboken Rail Yard Redevelopment Plan special meeting. So, Mark, uh, you know, we, mm. it appears the council members heard about this as recent as Friday based on an email sent uh, right. by Councilman DeFusco. Mm -hmm. So, they just heard about this on Friday. They uh, put the notice out and it looked like we were going to have a vote, and you know mm. how these uh, type of meetings go better than most. Mm. And as luck would happen, we end up not having a vote, and it was just a public hearing mm. that only had about six, yeah, actually not about it, had six pe public speakers. However, there was no time limit, so um, you could imagine how that would go in Hoboken. <laughs> <laughs> so a little disappointed that there was no vote, right, John? I would, I would say so, but uh, look, I, I understand that there was also a uh, potential issue with uh, legal notice. Of course, the Open Public Meetings Act is something that every municipality has to abide to, and uh, given that there's really no urgency on this project, I can understand why the city council and why the uh, Bala administration would want to proceed with an abundance of caution. So, yeah, sure. you know, while it may not be have been as much fun as it could have been, it uh, we certainly did learn a lot. I mean, there's a whole bunch of details we could go over here. Yeah, of course. Um, I mean, it's interesting, John, that they held another uh, special meeting to hear from the public. I mean, it was back in November when I was at the uh, Hoboken uh, Terminal, uh, where Alcor, representatives from Alcor, Vice President of Alcor, in fact, Brian Barry was there to talk to residents and commuters about uh, some of the changes to the uh, redevelopment plan for the Hoboken Rail Yard. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, obviously this is something that's been on the radar for several months, like you basically just said. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is, uh, I think this is at least 
the third version of the plan since October, maybe even more, but yeah. I think it's at least the third one. And I uh, just wanted to tell everyone about the, the, the changes. I mean, Site 1, which is an office building between Hudson Street and Hudson Place, would be between 200 or 300 feet tall, depending on a financial feasibility study, which will be determined uh, by a redevelopment agreement. And the maximum square footage would be 412,000 square feet if it's 200 feet tall, and it would then grow to 635,000 square feet if it's 300 feet mm -hmm. tall. And on top of that, Site 2 is a 330-foot building on Observer Highway between Hudson Street and Garden Street, and that had been designated as a residential tower, but now its usage will be determined by that financial feasibility study. Mm. So it's possible yeah. this could be a commercial building. It's possible uh, it's mixed use, but uh, it, it at one point was designated for just residential, no longer the case. Right. And another thing that I think is important is they talk about improvements at fair, or they talked about last night, ferry terminal building at Warrington Plaza improvements. and. Which, was, uh, uh, which, which seemed to be very well supported by First Ward Councilman Mike DeFusco. Yeah, it seemed like he was the one who was behind that idea. And, uh, you know, that would include a number of things, a performing arts center slash gallery, mm -hmm. a museum, museum, and a marketplace. And the other thing that I think was new that I don't believe we talked about in relation to the rail yard project, Mark, mm -hmm. is the Hudson Place Pedestrian Plaza and Circulation mm -hmm. design. Uh, that basically was how they will set up the buses, ride shares, and bicyclists to travel through the development quickly and safely. Right. As typically uh, seen in Hoboken, not everyone supported the plan. Sure. A lot of people said, you know, what's going on with the traffic? Not a lot, but some, mm -hmm. again, only six speakers. But yeah. some people had a problem with traffic still. They said, I want to see the traffic study. What does it say? And mm -hmm. if it's saying we could support more development, I don't understand that. Yeah. And uh, we also saw uh, one woman, Diane Feedy, speak out against the uh, pedestrian plaza saying that you're basically cutting off your regular commuters from that area. You're taking mm -hmm. away not only a, a thoroughfare to travel through, but also a place to park. And she said that could be up to 100 parking spaces put in jeopardy. And, uh, you know, as you saw last week, and I mean, as you knew way before that, sure. parking certainly a premium at Hoboken. It sure is, John. And then and not only did the parking issue come up, but the, uh, I guess you can call... Uh, well, an increase in the population in Hoboken because you had one resident who said that, well, another large scale development could easily push Hoboken's uh, population well above 60,000, maybe up to 62,000 with this uh, specific, uh, if, if residential development should occur. I mean, that was her main complaint. I mean, I know that there's been some changes. And as you said, site one, or was it site two? Site two. Where they're taking away the residential development, but nonetheless, that was. Uh, some of the uh, features of this plan warranted uh, a couple of residents, at least this one resident in particular, Mary Andreka, to say, well, if we have another large scale residential development in the city, it could well, as I said, could well push uh, Hoboken's uh, population above 60,000. Yeah, and there was also some complaints about uh, the feasibility study and the redevelopment plan because the council, some council members said a few times over that this is all conceptual, you know, we'll figure this out by the time the redevelopment plan is. Uh, comes out and you know some residents were like well you know I, I don't like that the council just voting on these hypothetical situations mm -hmm. like let's get it hammered down mm -hmm. however I do believe what they are to do the governing body is doing is pretty standard procedure mm -hmm. so with that said Mark I, I did also before we call it a, a day here I did want to also just give a quick update about this court battle between Alaris Health and CarePoint. Mm -hmm. So CarePoint, of course, is trying to sell the Hoboken University Medical Center and Christ Hospital, of course, in Hoboken and Jersey City, respectively. And they're in court with Alaris Health, uh, which is one of the top nursing chains in New Jersey. And they're alleging that he interfered with this whole process by buying property in Bayonne and Hoboken, the property that the actual hospital sit on. And now, in a counterclaim, Avery Eisenrich, the owner of Alaris, is saying that CarePoint owners embezzled millions as hospitals continue to lose money. That's our latest post on our website. Just went up at about 1.30 right before I was on my way over to the studio. So I highly uh, recommend you guys check that out. And with that, we're out of time. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Rod Greco. And, of course, thank you, everyone at Hudson Media Group. We'll see you next week.